and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in Session 5. I'd like to remind members to, uh, and members of the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices uh, to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. Um, we have received um, uh, apologies from Tavish Scott, MSP, who's going to be slightly late today. Um, our first item of business today is evidence on the implications of the EU referendum from, for Scotland and our future trading relationships. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, Keith Brown, MSP, and George Burgess, Deputy Director of EU and International Trade and Investment Policy, with the Scottish Government and Russell Bain, Team Leader, Analysis and Policy. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to begin by inviting the Cabinet Secretary to make a few opening remarks. Thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to come along this morning and to contribute to your investigation uh, into the potential future trade relationships for Scotland uh, following the EU referendum. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to reiterate, of course, the fact that Scotland did not uh, vote to leave the European Union. Um, our priority, therefore, is to protect Scotland's interests, and we are considering all possible steps to ensure Scotland's continuing relationship with the EU. Of course, that path in front of us is quite uncertain, and also given the conflicting information that we continue to hear from the UK government, uh, indeed, apparently, the Foreign Secretary is telling ambassadors that uh, he's in favour of uh, free movement of people. So very conflicting messages coming out of the UK government. Um, so for that reason, we have to be prepared for the possibility that the UK government will go for what we believe to be the worst of all possible options, which is a hard Brexit. It's not inevitable, but we have to prepare for that. Um, the Scottish Government is clear that Scotland's relationship with the EU and its place in the single market must be protected. Uh, and, of course, our aim is to get the best deal for Scotland in circumstances which, of course, are not of our choosing. Retaining membership of the single market for Scotland to protect our trading relationship with the EU and the rest of the world, of course, is extremely important. And any relationship which falls short of that risks increasing barriers to trade, reducing exports and lowering migration, all of which will affect rates of growth, but also reduce productivity. And that, for our part, is not a risk that we're prepared to take. At longer term, we know that independent economic forecasts point to a range of possible impacts for the economy from a redefined relationship with the EU. There is widespread agreement that a UK-EU trade relationship, which is reliant upon uh, WTO rules, which would effectively be a hard Brexit, represents the worst possible outcome for trade and for the economy. And the Fraser of Allender Institute, as you know, has estimated that leaving the single market under a World Trade Organization scenario could result in our economy being worse off by about 5% overall, or around £8 billion after a decade. And that's compared to the position if we remained within the EU. And that equates to around 80,000 fewer jobs and real wages lower by £2,000 a head per year. I think those figures of course, produced by the Fraser of Allender Institute, are underlined by some of the uh, Chancellor's um, projections uh, from the Autumn Statement. Uh, through membership of the single market, Scotland currently enjoys the free movement of goods, services, uh, workers and capital within the EU without any internal borders or other regulatory obstacles. Uh, and the single market removes barriers to trade with a market of over 500 million people and opens up opportunities for citizens, for workers, businesses and consumers. And the EU, of course, is the world's largest trading bloc. It's the largest trader of goods and services in the world. And it ranks first in both inbound and outbound international investments. 42% of Scottish international exports go to the EU. And eight of Scotland's top 12 export destinations are within the EU. Uh, Scottish exports to the EU worth around £11.6 billion in 2014. Uh, Scottish businesses wishing to export to or import from the EU uh, face no tariffs, quotas or duties applied to the goods that they trade, uh, and so a common set of regulations and rules apply. And we want to do more to boost exports from Scotland uh, even further, not just to the EU, but across global markets. And we're taking a range of measures to do this, including uh, establishing a trade uh, board, which I can confirm we started the appointment process for. 
And it's not to say that we prioritise our trade with the EU at the expense of our trade with the UK. We are clear that we want to maintain a relationship with both vital partners. The two are not, in our view, incompatible. We have heard, for example, from David Davis that there won't be a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, and I am confident that the same could be the case between Scotland and the rest of the UK, should Scotland be able to secure a relationship with the EU. I think, having mentioned the benefits, uh, trade benefits of being within the single market, it is also important to mention that the benefits go substantially further than just those. So free movement of people is particularly important to Scotland to help grow our population and drive economic growth. I think there was an example in London of a hotel which had around 208 members of staff, 200 of which uh, were EU nationals. And I think similarly our hospitality and other industries is very reliant upon EU nationals for their growth. Uh, finally, inward investment into Scotland has been an area of substantial success in recent years, with Ernst & Young figures consistently showing that Scotland is the top location for inward investment in the UK outside of London. Uh, and our place inside the single market is a critical factor in attracting this investment, with 79% of investors citing access to the single market as a key feature of the UK's attractiveness as an investment destination in 2016. So, in conclusion, convener, the vote to leave the EU is an unwelcome barrier on the road towards fulfilling our economic ambitions, and that's why the government's goal is to keep Scotland and, of course, uh, the whole of the UK, if possible, inside the single market. In the coming weeks, we'll be able to table specific proposals to protect Scotland's interests and to keep us in the single market, even if it is the case the rest of the UK decides to leave. And for that part, I would be very keen to hear the uh, work uh, and the views of the committee and try and answer any of its questions. Thank you. And thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, could I begin by asking you, be aware that the committee's work, uh, we've taken a lot of evidence and had a lot of discussions about the differences between membership of the sig single market and access to the single market. Um, could you perhaps reflect on your thinking and the differences between those two positions, at, you know, would access to the single market be acceptable as opposed to membership of the single market? Uh, well, membership of the market gives us the position which I outlined uh, in my statement of not having those barriers uh, to trade, uh, whether tariffs or other regulatory uh, barriers. Um, and that comes from being uh, a member of the single market. It's true to say, as others have said, that um, Virtually anybody can have access to that single market. It's a question of the terms on which they have that access. And there is nobody who has access, um, not even, I would suggest, those members of the EEA or EFTA who have membership of the single market on the same terms uh, that we currently have. Um, they don't have access, rather, to the single market in the same terms that people, uh, countries which are members of the single market have. So it really is about the absence of obstacles to trade. It's grown up over a substantial period of time. Actually, of course, one of the major proponents for it, as I've mentioned before, was Margaret Thatcher, um, who was a, a staunch proponent of the single market. Um, and obviously, that's you're talking now about the mid to late 1980s. So you've seen the single market develop over a longer period of time. It's not just it happened. It wasn't something that wasn't there one day and appeared the next. It's had to grow over that period. So disentangling that to any extent, um, even if it allows a degree of access afterwards, is not, um, in my view uh, or the government's view, a substitute for membership of that, where you do not have uh, the barriers, you don't have the uh, regulations, you don't have the practices which can be limiting for trade uh, and economic business. So I think those are the main differences between access and being a member of the uh, single market. Okay, thank you for that. What consultation has the Scottish Government undertaken with uh, various sectors across Scotland about our future trading relationship, and how has that informed your thinking in terms of the Government's position? Uh, there's been a huge degree of consultation, so I think just from my own part, but it's true of other ministers, uh, just to give some examples, um, myself and uh, Mike Russell met with um, all the... Uh, well, the major Japanese uh, companies which operate, uh, for example, uh, in Scotland. So that was after the note from the Japanese government to the UK government, which I think at that time was perhaps the most um, 
uh, rigorous uh, analysis of the implications of Brexit for business, because the way the Japanese government did it was they consulted heavily with business before putting that note uh, together. So we've done that, whether it's through FISAB, um, a, the Financial uh, Services Board, which we are on jointly with uh, the financial sector, who have a, a, a huge interest, as you can imagine, in this. Uh, colleagues, other colleagues have also been talking to the agriculture and a, a fisheries sector. In addition to that, we have had a national economic forum, which um, both I and Paul Wheelhouse, the business minister, spoke at, and of course the first minister uh, addressed as well. Um, so I think it, over a range of the different sectors, we have had, um, I mean, even last night to meet with uh, business organisations, the CBI will meet with them again later on today, with the big six, we met with them all immediately afterwards. And indeed, on the morning uh, after the um, vote on the EU, uh, the 24th, we had, first of all, a call with the Governor of the Bank of England, which the uh, First Minister and other ministers were involved in. And then over the course of that weekend, I spoke to nearly all the chief executives of the major financial institutions. But since then, it's been an almost non-stop um, series of discussions with uh, different sectors and business organisations about the impact. And I would say, you know, top of the list of the things which have been mentioned have been um, th what we mentioned before in terms of movement of people. Um, so the higher education sector has been very concerned about that from very early on, uh, but other sectors as well. It involves parts of my portfolio, like the major projects that we're involved in. We have substantial numbers of EU nationals involved in completing those projects, like the Queensferry Crossing, the M8 bundle, the AWPR, and so on. But for the financial sector, it was very much about passporting um, and the continued beneficial effects of being within the single market. So there's been very substantial consultation across the sectors. Right. And, and have there any of the businesses that you've spoken to reflected on the effect of the fall, falling value of the pound on their businesses? Yes, and I think it's fair to say that some of those have seen an advantage from that. Uh, obviously, those which um, export. So, if you talk to the Scotch Whisky Association, um, whom we've also been in correspondence with, um, they will see uh, a benefit from that. Um, but as against that, uh, you have people that have been badly affected by that. So a company that I visited in uh, Ayrshire, which uh, uh, produces um, patio doors and um, uh, double glazing and so on, uh, they manufactured as well as fit uh, these units, but they get their glass from Ireland, and they were talking about a 16% increase in costs having been imposed because of uh, those exchange rates. So the input costs to business, of course, have been substantially increased because of the exchange rate, whereas other businesses will have benefited, of course, from that change as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now pass on to my colleague Lewis MacDonald. <coughs> thank you very much. And, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think I heard you say in reply to the convener, um, uh, uh, her first question, that even EFTA countries, which are members of the EEA, do not have the same access to the uh, uh, single market as that we currently enjoy as full members of the single market. That's, that fairly reflects what, what, what you said. Yeah, by which I meant, uh, I mean, apart from any other aspects, they don't have the say in how the single market is formed. Obviously, they have that uh, ability to access it, but they don't have the same rights in terms of how the market's taken forward. Well, the, we, we had evidence um, a couple of weeks ago from Dag Werner Holter of uh, EFTA, who, who uh, said that, uh, in, in his view, and, and I think this perhaps also reflects, and I'd be interested if this also reflects what was in your mind, full membership of the single market would normally also imply being part of the customs union, uh, but uh, EFTA EEA states are not part of the customs union. Would you agree that that's a significant uh, loss as well if, if we are not members as on the current basis, not only would we not have a say in their rules and regulations, we would also be out with the customs union, and that is very significant. Yeah, I think, it's, as I've said, I, we believe that the current situation where you're members of the customs union, you have full membership of the single market is the optimum uh, position to be in, and anything that moves away from that is going to be to the uh, detriment both of the Scottish economy and, indeed, to the UK economy. So. I think it's also important to say, I suppose it's a very obvious point, that when people voted on the 23rd of June, um, even those voting uh, to uh, leave the EU didn't necessarily vote for um, leaving either a customs union or the single market. And it now seems to have become a shorthand, 
certainly for some people that that vote means leaving the single market. I don't think that was ever on. It was in the minds of many people. I appreciate that, but some people were explicitly saying we did not want to vote for that when we voted to leave. So yeah, that that's the optimum position just now, and uh, you want to try and maintain that optimum position. Clearly, for countries like Norway and and, and Iceland, which are members of EFTA, but and, and members of the European Economic Area, but not members of the European Union, the. People, I think, rightly say that the four freedoms are, 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 are implicit in the single market. However, you would, I think, recognise that areas like agriculture and fisheries lie out with the terms of, this, of, of the European economic area. And therefore, although in principle, full freedom of, goods, of movement of goods and services is part of the single market arrangement, in practice, there are some qualifications to that. Yeah, I think there will always be qualifications, but I think those qualifications, as I say, in the evolution of the single market since uh, the mid-1980s, we've seen those gradually removed, but uh, I, I, I recognise the reality of the position that you, you mentioned. I think that the real fear is that any change to that, and actually even now the uncertainty over whether there will be changes or the extent to which there will be changes is a... Uh, is, uh, um, a dampener on economic activity. Um, so we don't want to see further changes to I recognise the exceptions you mentioned, but we don't see, want to see uh, further changes to that because we think it's detrimental to the Scottish economy. And actually, we had a meeting with one of the major business organisations, I think within 10 days of the vote, and they had said, one member um, had said they had lost a contract already at that stage because um, the people involved in placing the contract didn't see they had certainty over, uh, in this case, Scotland's place in the EU. It was a specifically EU-related uh, project uh, in Dundee. So, yeah, I mean, we don't want to see we have enough to contend with in terms of making sure the economy grows. Uh, we don't want to see further obstacles placed in our way. You, you mentioned that specific proposals will come forward shortly on, <coughs> on um, how to address some of these issues. Do you envisage those specific proposals covering the issue of the customs union and covering trade and goods that are not included within the terms of the European Economic Area Agreement? Uh, well, we'll have to wait and see what's brought forward. But I think uh, what it will cover is, um, I think, first of all, how we would envisage Scotland maintaining the current benefits of membership of, um, uh, of the single market. And it will also, I am sure, uh, talk about the hierarchy of concerns and uh, positions we want to achieve. We do, our preference is to see the UK stay within the EU, that would be uh, in the co uh, single market, which is, uh, um, I think, beneficial to Scotland uh, as well, as Scotland staying within the single market. So we will cover a number of um, different, um, if you like, options and priorities and make clear what our preference is. F finally, I, I accept that, that the Scottish Government has been clear from a very early stage mm -hmm that the single market is a, a desirable outcome. I think there's been less clarity around the customs union, and clearly many of the tariff and non-tariff barriers you've mentioned arise from the customs, or would arise in the absence of membership of the customs union. I wonder if you could cast light on that this morning as, as to the Scottish Government's view of the importance of the customs union in going I, forward. I think that's better done when we publish our proposals, to be honest, and of course we'll be open to question on aspects like that, but I think I wouldn't want to... Uh, unveil it before it's unveiled, if you like. It'll be for others, uh, the First Minister in particular, to, to bring that forward. But I think it will cover these areas, and of course we're open to question on uh, what we have put forward. And I have to say that having gone round, you know, most recently as last night, but um, uh, other business organisations and economic stakeholders, they will tell you, and I think every member here must have heard the same from business organisations about how concerned they are about that. Um, continuing not just uncertainty but what they perceive to be a lack of focus as to where the UK government is going uh, and correspondingly I've had for my part fairly encouraging responses to the fact that the Scottish government will make as best it can uh, clear its proposals um, very shortly so but when that happens, of course, um, not just this committee, but all the committees of the Parliament and the various economic actors will be able to interrogate and question um, our proposals, which there is not long to wait for them coming forward now. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm bringing Richard Lockhead now. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Uh, two questions. Firstly, we don't know clearly what's going to happen at the end of the next two years process and where Scotland will be left. But if we do end up in a scenario where 
The UK has gone down the road of hard Brexit, and Scotland has managed to negotiate some way of achieving a softer Brexit. And at the same time, given what the UK government have said about Ireland, there's no hard border between Scotland and England, then do you believe there'll be opportunities for investment in Scotland because there'll be a competitive advantage in Scotland because any company wanting to invest in the UK but wanting access to the softer Brexit conditions would therefore be attracted to invest in Scotland? Uh, yes, I do. And I think that follows from what I said in my opening statement, where in terms of uh, our attractiveness as a, lo a, a location for inward investment, um, many companies who do make that decision do so, if not on the basis, certainly taking into account the access that we have under current circumstances to the single market. So I think it, it follows from that that... Um, depending on what the exact outcome is, the more you have something akin to um, membership of that uh, single market, the more attractive you will be to um, inward investors. So, yes, I think there is, uh, not easy to quantify at this stage, but there's a definite benefit uh, from Scotland having retained that. As I say, I think the same benefits would accrue to the rest of the UK were they to take the decision to remain within uh, the single market. But... I also believe that uh, if it's a differentiated um, outcome in terms of the relationship to the single market, those that have the closest relationship to what we currently have will be in a position of advantage. I think that is true. Okay. My second question relates to a bit of a pet subject, which is the food and drink industry, mm. uh, given that it's yes, the most successful yes. exporting sector in Scotland in recent years. And the industry still has huge opportunities in terms of global markets. And I'm just wondering what thought the government's giving to putting an insurance policy in place, given again we don't know what's going to happen in terms of a relationship with Europe, to exploit the opportunities in these wider global markets for food and drink in particular, given that it could create tens of thousands of new jobs by securing those export opportunities in the emerging markets in the Far East and so on and so forth. Do you agree we have to really redouble our our efforts in terms of making the most of those opportunities around the world? I do, and I think it, it, as well as trying to plan for the future, we're actively undertaking that kind of work now, which builds on the work done not least by, by yourself, but over recent years there's been a, a phenomenal increase in terms of um, food and drink uh, exports. I think even the Foreign and Commonwealth Office this week was tweeting about how important the Scotch whisky sector was, for example, um, to uh, the UK economy. So there's been huge success. Um, and if you look at some of the examples, say, for example, to China, uh, where you saw, I think I'm right in saying, and I acknowledge Richard Lockhead would know this better than me, but um, uh, I think it was shellfish in one particular case went from zero to over £20 million pounds in a very short period of time. So we're aware of the potential that's there. Um, we are trying to upscale um, in the short term our presence uh, around the EU, so doubling the number of SDI uh, members of staff within the EU, but also continuing to look into markets like China, um, Brazil. Um, and if you um, think of the size of those two markets alone, you can see what the potential is and we haven't uh, exploited them nearly enough as yet, but we have made inroads. So, for example, recently I met with a, a whole series of um, chief executives from India looking to invest in Scotland and also um, to talk about exports to India. So I don't think it's um, just something that we have to plan for the future, although we're doing that in the way that we're configuring SDI. It also underlies part of the rationale for the review of um, enterprise and skills agencies, which we're currently involved in. But we are doing that now, and I think you're right to say we've achieved a huge amount in relation to this, but there's much more that we can achieve. OK. And just finally, just to say, I'm very impressed with your knowledge of the shellfish sector in Scotland and the statistics. But I would urge the, the government to accelerate our efforts to exploit those opportunities around the world and learn from the New Zealands and the Norways, which are small countries that have really refocused their export strategies in the past decades with huge economic success. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Um, last night I attended the cross-party group on tourism and one of the issues, uh, one of the points that were raised uh, was regarding that of reputation 
uh, and, the, and Scotland's reputation for be, and also the UK's reputation for being open uh, for business. And the example was given, and it was by, this is by, the, by Mike Russell, the, the example was given of a report that appeared in a newspaper in India within the last few weeks of five reasons not to study in the UK because of the, the Brexit implications. Uh, do you think uh, the, the issue of the reputation and uh, Scotland's economic opportunity, do you think the reputation is, uh, is really crucial in this, in terms of the, the single market and also the customs union? I do, and I think that reputation is, um, notwithstanding the example you've just given, a very good reputation. I think it's true, as you say, for the whole of the UK, but in particular for Scotland. I'd imagine, and I haven't seen these five reasons um, uh, not to come here uh, in relation to India, I'd imagine top of the list would be something like the post-study work visa, which became very prominent when the Prime Minister visited India recently, and was also or the absence of any movement on the part of the UK government was the, one of the reasons why we got so little from that. But I do think that the international reputation, both of Scotland and the UK, as um, as visitor destinations is extremely good and we've seen real growth in terms of tourism uh, over recent years and it's also true to say in relation to I think a question from Lewis MacDonald about the exchange rate that's been a beneficial impact as well although I do think we were seeing substantial growth uh, just anecdotally I think the Edinburgh Festival and Fringe this year is somebody who's um, was born and brought up in Edinburgh I've never seen it as busy or reaching different parts of the city as it was this year um, and I think the thing is to make sure we capitalise on that. So things like the NC500 going around the top uh, of Scotland, it opens up uh, new areas. And some of the hospitality establishments there are, were struggling to cope with the new demand which that initiative had brought. So uh, we do have substantial benefits. It's probably best if we don't have uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office tweets which show the wrong bridge when they're trying to um, claim credit for the Queen's Ferry crossing rather bizarrely, uh, but showed a a uh, picture of the rail bridge, which in itself is a pretty good attraction for Scotland, I think. Um, so I think we do have that, but our international reputation, I think, is extremely important. And so part of the initiative I mentioned before about increasing the number of SDI staff uh, in the EU, for example, we often talk about India and China, which is becoming increasingly important, but Germany is an extremely important market for tourism here in Scotland. Um, I think we have to make sure we do more across the EU as well as in other destinations. And of course, uh, North America is also extremely important, not just for the numbers, but for the amount that's spent by North American visitors when they come to Scotland. So I think we have a, an extremely good product, product to sell. Um, and I would hope that the uh, large amount of international activity being undertaken just now, especially by the First Minister, by Mike Russell and others, will also have that benefit of raising Scotland's profile. Um, people will have different views, I'm sure, on the, the referendum in 2014. But that, along with the Ryder Cup, uh, along with the Commonwealth Games, all raise Scotland's profile internationally to a very large extent. And I think we have to try and capitalise on that to help what is already a very strong industry in Scotland in relation to tourism. Uh, and certainly in terms of the, you know, the customs union, what assessment uh, has the Scottish Government made uh, of the potential costs to Scottish businesses of non-tariff barriers, such as the customs checks, rules of origin checks and the product testing, uh, in the event that uh, the UK and Scotland leaves the customs union? Well, I've mentioned some of the work that's been done already. Um, and if you look at some of the studies done by um, Fraser of Allander and so on, they will give indications as to what uh, the implications of uh, barriers. I, I think also for those of us old enough to remember that um, when you had to go through such barriers um, previously going around Europe, it is a disincentive. Uh, th I suppose for some people there was always a fear that they wouldn't get access, uh, you know, when they come into a, a customs bo uh, barrier. So I think it's um, pretty obvious that if you have those kind of barriers, that acts as an inhibition on, um, I suppose, movement of people for purposes other than employment, you know, to visit and so on. Um, so I, I don't say, I don't think that anybody would argue against the position that having barriers where previously there were none is going to be anything other than a bad thing for uh, movement of people uh, in relation, in this case, to tourism. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm going to just uh, one of the, the areas that, uh, that I've got an interest in is that of the uh, cruise tourism, mm -hmm. also with uh, the Greenwood Ocean Terminal. And over the last two years, uh, over 200,000 uh, people have come into Scotland. Um, through cruise ships uh, going to Greenock. And uh, that's one of the, the areas of concern has been the face-to-face -face, uh, passport checks uh, that uh, you'll be aware of. 
and the, just in terms of the, the added time uh, and also the added uh, financial cost uh, that, uh, that is born from that. And how, how important, going back to the issue of, of reputation, but also the, uh, the, actual, the welcome that people will actually get when they come in. And bear in mind, most of the, the passengers are European, as well as the, uh, you get the additional time constraints as well for the staff. And how important uh, do you think some of these, uh, these non-tariff uh, barriers actually are in terms of trying to encourage people uh, to come into Scotland? Well, I remember discussions we had at that time. I think I was uh, transport minister at the time and had that interest. And, and it does have an effect. I think if, if you're somebody, a new EU citizen, going round waters of the EU, you don't expect to have that kind of face-to-face -face, uh, interrogation as it sometimes was about your right to be there in the first place. So I think it, come, it came certainly to some of those people as a surprise and, of course, they would relate that experience to others. And, of course, that's not what you want to have when you're trying to relax on a cruise. And the importance of this industry in Scotland is huge in your own area, uh, obviously. But we have recently, with the UK government, agreed to invest substantially in the Aberdeen City deal, part of which is about the enhancement of the harbour. They're trying to attract more cruise ships. It's extremely important in the Northern Isles in Scotland. The Western Isles is looking to do a lot more. So if you're looking to grow that trade as we are, and, of course, the benefits, if you have some very substantial cruise ships of people visiting the shore, uh, it can be very substantial for local businesses, um, you know, whether it's in the Forth, uh, in the Northern Isles or elsewhere. So if you have that perception growing, it can be a difficult place to come to. You might get stopped and checked. And also the way it was done, I think, happened very quickly. So people had uh, no um, understanding that might happen to them in terms of those face-to-face -face, uh, interviews from before. Uh, then it can have a detrimental effect. And we made representations to the UK government at the time to say this, this, this could do that. So I think you're right, and it points to the general principle that the more straightforward it is for people to visit other countries, in this case by cruise ship, the less likely they are to um, feel that kind of intrusion. There's obviously got to be a legitimate role for, you know, for security services and other uh, parts of the state to be able to protect themselves, but I think in terms of that recreational activity, that acts as a disincentive. And we could see more and more of that as a result of Brexit. <coughs> uh, can you just um, I'm afraid I'm going to have okay. to move on, um, perhaps later. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet morning. Secretary. Um, Richard Lockhead mentioned food and drink industry, and I'm interested in highlighting agriculture and the business that might be affected because of our exit from the European Union. And we've heard previously about WTO tariff options and how they relate to agriculture. So I'm interested in whether the government has done any assessment of the impact of, on Scotland of trading under WTO rules, in particular regarding agriculture, and also uh, how the Scottish government is working with the UK government to ensure devolved interests such as shares of tariff rate quotas and allowance for agricultural subsidies are actually firmly considered as the UK seeks to negotiate new trade deals? Uh, uh, yes, we have. Uh, we had the Scottish Government paper from August which summarised the impact that leaving the EU could have uh, on uh, Scotland based on itself recent studies. That analysis indicates that Scottish GDP could be up to £11.2 billion pounds lower, as I mentioned, by 2030 compared to uh, the forecast GDP in the absence of Brexit, and specifically WTO trading relationships, if that was what was to be the result, um, could reduce um, Scottish GDP by uh, that extent. Um, we also applied analysis of Treasury uh, by the Treasury on the impact of UK tax revenues to Scotland, which suggests that we could see our tax revenues uh, reduce uh, between £1.7 billion and £3.7 billion a year by 2030. And, of course, I've mentioned the separate modelling that we had undertaken by, uh, by the um, Fraser of Allander Institute uh, with a WTO scenario. Perhaps on the particular point uh, as well about agriculture, maybe uh, Mr Burgess could help answer that. Uh, yes, certainly. There's, I've been in touch with the Department for International Trade, specifically around the, 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 the tariff uh, quotas issue, uh, uh, together with uh, colleagues leading on agriculture and and food areas to make sure that Scotland is a sort of full and equal partner in the UK government's considerations 
uh, of its approach to the WTO on that. I think otherwise there's a, there's a risk that Department for International Trade will look simply to DEFRA and not to the whole of the of the UK. Um, as well, there's an issue about n not just what quotas the UK and the EU set, but the quotas that are set by other countries for exports from from uh, the UK and, and EU. My sense is that the UK government is only beginning its consideration of that, but I think rest assured that we will be making sure that Scottish interests are well represented and heard in that. Can I just add to that? I think um, engagement with the UK government has been quite frustrating over a number of areas. Uh, but DEFRA, I think because of the engagement they've had previously with devolved administrations, has been a bit more engaged than perhaps some of those other areas. Some of my colleagues could mention that um, or, or talk about that uh, more than I could. But I think DEFRA have had that uh, relationship in the past. So that, that relationship um, has been a bit more productive than it has been in some other areas. And just to go back to your point about um, a, the the situation with the EU. It's not just about uh, the EU, as, as uh, Mr Burgess says, but we have, through the trade agreements that the EU has made, um, agreements with over 50 uh, countries. So we're working closely with the industry to understand the full implications. I think that's something perhaps that the public debate is not focused on so much. You know, the, the, the power of the EU in actually achieving these. And also, if you end up with a hard Brexit, say, for the whole of the UK, in trying to come to the trade agreements everyone talks about, you're going to have to contend with a very large and powerful um, EU, which might have different interests. So I think that's extremely important. And just to say that, for example, 80% of Scotland's red meat exports are destined for the EU, uh, and figures from the industry show that the value of beef and lamb exports in the EU in 2015 was approximately £73 million, pound, which accounts, as I say, for about um, 80 per cent. But if we were to be subject to the current tariffs that apply to countries out with the EU, which would be the potential outcome from a hard Brexit, then the same volume of beef and lamb would cost around 50 per cent more for importers to buy our products. So you can see the disadvantage we'd suffer as a result of that. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson Carlaw. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Good morning. Secretary. Uh, can I say that the, the reasons many of us did vote to remain, I thought, were neatly summarised in terms of uh, our international trading relationships and your opening remarks. And insofar as you are working to secure new business for us wherever in the globe, obviously we commend you for that. And the whole Parliament, I hope, would support you in those endeavours. I should also say, as the convener of the committee that recommended the design of the fourth crossing to uh, Parliament, that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office are very often lacking in their understanding of domestic matters. Um, I'd like to ask you about the uh, broader uh, international trading relationships that are emerging. Uh, the Scottish Government and the Green Party, I think it could be said, have been hand in glove with uh, President-elect Trump, a happy thing, I think, in relation to their view of TTIP. Uh, and the uh, route to international trading through large block arrangements. The prospective new uh, trading secretaries of the United States have said very much they're in favour of bilateral agreements. Um, and I wonder what conversations you have had. Have you, like the Mayor of London, had an opportunity to have conversations with the Secretary of State for International Trade about how Scotland's interests, irrespective of the environment we find ourselves in in the future, um, are reflected in what appear to be moves towards more bilateral agreements with major trading blocks than uh, with major with major countries rather than trading block agreements because this clearly will be crucial for many of the products the food and drink sector that we were talking about uh, to secure Scotland's interests. So I'm just wondering what opportunities you've had to have meetings uh, with the Department of International Trade. I know your colleague touched on that, but uh, because that, I think, is going to be a crucial part of the future environment, irrespective of how this whole issue of the European Union settles. I think um, Jackson Carlos is exactly right to say that whatever the scenario that transpires, we have to make the best of that, and we have to work within that environment. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure uh, hand in glove with President-elect Trump in relation to TTIP is the way I would describe um, our respective approaches to TTIP. Uh, but uh, what we have done um, is have that discussion. So I met with the uh, Secretary of State probably just before he made his comment about British businesses being 
uh, fat and on the golf course every Friday, which I'm not sure how that would have promoted uh, either trade from Britain or elsewhere. But we did actually come to, I think, uh, a constructive agreement whereby I had laid out for him some of the things I've mentioned before about how we intend to upscale in the EU and elsewhere our activity in terms, I suppose, it would have to be characterised as trade promotion. We're not able, of course, in this Parliament to strike trade agreements. But, um, And I did say uh, to him at that stage that I would want to see that being done with the UK government. The UK government, whatever we think of the political settlement we have just now, has a, a wider network of offices around the world. They are meant to represent Scotland as well. Scottish taxpayers pay into that, and I think it's fair to say we don't feel that we get, if you like, the support that we should do in relation to the way that international trade is promoted through that network. So I had laid out uh, to Liam Fox that I wanted to see um, the work that we are doing to expand because of the oncoming um, threats of, of Brexit and so on, to expand our presence I would like to see that being done with the UK. I generally want to see that being done with the UK government. So what we've tried to achieve is, and this is also true of the economic, so the economic development and skills review, a much more focused um, uh, international presence so that uh, sometimes we can have people, if not working against each other from Scotland, you can get a visit in a, in a country whereby the minister may be there one week, somebody from university the next. Uh, one of the trade organisations at the Chambers of Commerce may have an event a month later. So I think we have to be more focused in relation to that. And I think that focus should also include what the UK government can offer through its um, network as well. So. We have had those discussions. I've, I've spoken directly with Liam Fox uh, on that, and of course, interna um, international uh, trade elements in both the governments have had that conversation at official level as well. So, uh, and it may be the case if we have to rely increasingly on bilateral trade agreements. I think that is extremely problematic, not least because it cannot even be begun until after we've exited the EU because of the nature of obligations to the EU, and that kind of um, hiatus, I think, is not going to be good for trade. So I suppose the bottom line is we've not accepted that hiatus. We're trying to upscale what we're doing, um, not just in the EU, but around the world in the markets which are important to us. And I am happy and keen that that should be done in conjunction with the UK government. Yeah. Uh, sorry, maybe just uh, briefly to add, uh, Lord Price, the Minister for State and Department for International Trade, uh, visited Scotland recently, met with Paul Wheelhouse. He outlined his department's approach and the first priority there is sorting out the UK's uh, schedules of commitments at the WTO, followed by getting a trade arrangement in place with the EU and then with those countries with which the EU has uh, a trade arrangement. New bilateral trade agreements with other countries seem to be relatively far down the queue, even though there have been, as uh, members will have seen from the press, you know, in engagements with Australia, New Zealand uh, and, and India. I think as well there's also an assumption that bilateral will be faster than uh, sort of the multilateral agreements. You know, CETA has taken I think about seven years for negotiation. If we look, the EFTA countries already have a, a, a trade agreement with, with Canada, but it, it, even with a smaller block dealing with Canada, itself took about ten years for negotiation. So bilateral is not necessary. But is that not the distinction? You're dealing with a block rather than bilaterally with two countries, uh, where, of course, the arrangement is one between two countries and not one between two countries that then has to be endorsed by half a dozen others in the block. And that, I think, has been the problem with TTIP, uh, which the United States is now disassociating itself from, mm -hmm. as many other governments or representatives in various governments or countries across uh, the other affected nations have expressed concerns about too. I am encouraged, however, I mean, um, the, the, the meeting you had with Dr. Fox, who I think has volunteered to come to this committee at some point, by definition, if you were referencing it to the golf course comment, was some time ago. Uh, is there in prospect a, the opportunity for an ongoing uh, schedule of meetings between you and the Secretary of State? Because, you know, I do feel very strongly that uh, we do need to ensure that Scotland's interests are fully represented uh, in whatever these new arrangements are that he is seeking to negotiate on behalf of the United Kingdom, because if the outcome of this is not the one that is preferred uh, by the Scottish Government, then it will be fundamentally important that Scotland's opportunities are maximised in those new arrangements. 
Uh, yes, and we agreed to have uh, further meetings. Uh, I would say that that was perhaps easier to achieve than it has been in many other areas um, with the UK government. So we had that willingness and we have uh, agreed we'll have further meetings. I think, though, just to come back to the point about um, bilateral agreements, one of the major issues we have is we do not have, either in Scotland or the UK, the expertise uh, to carry out these, certainly a large range of potential bilateral agreements. I mean, one comment from somebody who I'll not mention whose name everyone would know if I did, uh, said that if it had been the case that the UK had, had, had been having to carry out the discussions on CETA, they would, in their words, have been eaten alive by the trade negotiators, which Canada has, because they've been doing this, obviously, for a long period of time. And I think I'm right in saying that somebody like KPMG has been tasked by the UK government to cast around the world to get people that have got that expertise with limited success, it seems to me, a bit of a reversal about their approach from free movement of people to actually try and get people around the world to come here to help negotiate Brexit. But that's a genuine concern. If, say, things go according to the timetable which the UK government has set out and we have Article 50 in March next year and then we leave the EU in two years' time, within that period we're going to have to, had to have scaled up massively on the experience of... Um, discussing these trade deals uh, with some extremely hard-headed and experienced trade negotiators around the world. And doing that for one country, uh, say like Canada, is a big enough task, but to do it simultaneously for India, for China, for Australia, for the US, seems to me like um, a pretty big task. But on the basic points uh, that uh, Jackson Carlow makes about continuing engagement with the UK government, we want to do that. Uh, as has been said, Lord Price has also been here, I think, on two occasions, certainly met with Paul Wheelhouse on one occasion, and we'll have further meetings with, Lord Fo uh, okay. with Dr Fox as well. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. Um, Ross Greer. Thanks, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned the immediate post-Brexit uh, post period. If, if we were in the theoretical situation of being part of a UK which is in a hard Brexit WTO default situation, that immediate period is <coughs> shocking and, and potentially quite damaging, certainly damaging to the Scottish economy. Has the Scottish Government considered what actions you would be able to take to mitigate as much of the damage there as possible if we are in that situation? Uh, well, yes, and I suppose that... that um, understanding that that might be a potential outcome is one of the things that underlies the activities we're, we're undertaking just now. So you've seen, as I've said, we are not able to um, a, a reach trade agreements. It's not within the remit of this parliament or the government in Scotland. But what we can do is promote those relationships, um, and we're doing a lot of work around that. So if you did have, as you quite rightly say, this sudden and huge shock it would be um, to people with, active within the economy in Scotland in terms of having their trade relationships um, uh, altered in such a dramatic way to go down to WTO rules. I mean, I should say there's also work going on within the UK government to try and disentangle some of the quotas which are uh, currently um, laid out in the EU law but not disaggregated. So there's work going on, uh, it's true as well, at the UK government level. But Preparation for that, for that kind of uh, shock uh, is something that's implicit in what we're doing, while at the same time, as I've mentioned, and what we intend to uh, propose very shortly, we're trying to see if we can avoid that scenario. And going back to Jackson Carlow's point about trade deals, I uh, wouldn't want to put words into your mouth, but the Green Party certainly always felt that we came more from the Bernie Sanders school of thought on uh, these deals than the Trump school. But... Given that, I think it was last week or the week before, we found that the Scottish NHS wasn't exempt from CETA, and uh, your comments a moment ago around the relative inexperience of the UK's uh, trade negotiators, is this mix of ideological motivation at the Department of International Trade and inexperience a recipe for huge risk to Scottish public services in any future trade deal? Um, in future, yes, I would have to say in relation to CETA, obviously that was carried out by EU negotiators who themselves are pretty experienced in, in relation to this. Um, unfortunately, we don't carry out that negotiation. It's still to be ratified, I think, by the UK Parliament, as it will have to be by all uh, EU states. Um, we don't carry out that, so we can make our views known, as we did through TTIP, on the very point that you mentioned. Um, but yes, I think that is a concern, that if you... And it isn't something that should be easily brushed under the carpet. Um, if you have a situation where you're going to move to have to carry out all your own trade negotiations and do it on a global basis, um, whereas all your current trade um, deals that you have and the trade environment is set by the EU, 
as I've said, a large, powerful trading bloc, the biggest in the world, uh, then you really have to go into that prepared. And, and if you have a situation where you're trying desperately to cast around to get people uh, from overseas to come and do that, first of all, how sufficiently are they aware of UK um, trade and industry and its requirements, apart from the other aspects that you mentioned? So I think that's a real threat that's not being given sufficient, um, a, a sufficient uh, focus. And you're quite right if what you're saying is that in that scenario, too few people, too little experience trying to do too much in too quick a time scale, then the potential for things to be missed to our disadvantage, whether Scotland or the UK, must be pretty high. And just very briefly, um, there's been discussion already, this committee certainly looked at it, the potential need to reevaluate the devolution settlement in the event of Brexit, where powers are repatriated to, is it to Westminster or directly to here? Um, would that be a case for perhaps a wider look at Scotland's relationship with the rest of the UK. CETA is a very good example where it was the Canadian provinces had a, a huge level of involvement because deals can't be approved without them. Is this a case for the Scottish Government to start arguing for a serious statutory role in these negotiations, or at least in the approval of any final deal? I think that's almost, if you like, our standing position that we want to have the maximum possible role. And you're right to say, I mean, obviously Canada's a <coughs> a confederal system where the provinces have very substantial powers. <coughs> but yes, I, th I think, especially if it's the case that um, a UK government uh, of whichever political persuasion and a Scottish government of a very different political persuasion have different priorities, then it seems to me, you know, if a country like Canada, a confederal country, can make sure that it, um, a, it takes a very a substantial cue from the needs of its provinces, uh, I'm not uh, likening Scotland to a province by any means, but I think we should be able to do that within the UK. And I think you, you've, you've seen that um, uh, debate develop further. It's perhaps uh, difficult to be focused uh, on a specific outcome because there's so much that seems to be uncertain just now. And I say that from uh, talking to the business community in the last week, how, how they feel that they've never had a period quite like this in terms of so much being uncertain and so few cues as to how things might go. So. But yes, of course, we, we've always had a position we try to maximise the role of Scotland in any of these things. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. I have a quick supplementary from Liz MacDonald. You, you talked about increasing reliance on bilateral agreements being extremely problematic. Do you acknowledge that an increasing reliance on bilateral agreements is likely under almost any imaginable scenario? I'm thinking, for example, of EFTA and the European Economic Area, where those countries whether within or without the EEA, have uh, access to uh, arrangements with the European Union, but also have bilateral agreements and the freedom to negotiate bilateral agreements elsewhere. Uh, EFTA members can also collectively negotiate, as we heard, in relation to Canada. And um, as Mr Burgess said, there are 50 countries out with the European Union with which the European Union currently has trade arrangements. Um, any scenario of being out with the European Union presumably means that those uh, agreements have to be negotiated again, even were we to remain in the single market. So, um, would you, first of all, would you acknowledge that increasing reliance on bilateral agreements is inevitable? And, and, and secondly, could you say a bit more about how the Scottish Government is uh, able to put across to the UK Government and others uh, what our international trade priorities are? It, I mean, yes, I think if things go, and again, it's, it's back to that idea of being uncertain as to how things um, will develop, but if uh, there is this increasing uh, reliance on uh, bilateral agreements, then first of all, in relation to EFTA countries, they're going to want to make sure they do nothing in their negotiations with other countries that upsets the relationship or undermines the relationship um, in, in relation to the single market. That's, they're going to be very conscious of that. But I think if you take one example, the, UK, the EU has not managed, um, despite the wealth of experience it's got, to reach a trade agreement with India. If you imagine the situation of a hard Brexit, the UK uh, or Scotland trying to strike a deal with India, what's going to be further up the list of priorities for India? Is it well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but, but my question is really about the softest imaginable Brexit. Are, right. there any, are there any circumstances in the view of the Scottish Government in which... Uh, bilateral agreements will not be required in order to take forward trade in the future? Uh, well, yes, if we retain membership um, of the EU, which is something that we've yeah. said that we would uh, want to achieve as well. Yeah. But, but only in those circumstances? 
Well, it depends again on the nature of how, if you retain membership to the single market, the, the terms on which that happens as well. So it, there are circumstances in which you can avoid having to do that. And, and, and finally, in, in, in relation to the ability of the Scottish Government to discuss these matters with the Department for International Trade, what is the uh, what what is your existing at home in within the Scottish Government in Scotland? What uh, departmental support will you have, and what expertise do you have in house for such negotiations? Well, we have. <coughs> I think you'll know the configuration of the Scottish Government, but you'll appreciate that since uh, Brexit there's been a substantial amount of reorganisation to make sure that that um, support uh, and the civil service is configured. So the establishment of, for example, a, a specific economy unit uh, within the Government, <coughs> and as I've mentioned, the upscaling of our activities um, through SDI, but also through the Enterprise and Skills Review, what we're seeing is the ability to focus more clearly on those things. We don't have the resources that obviously the UK government has in relation to that. But Brexit, um, I mean, it's interesting when I got this job, Brexit didn't exist really. Um, and it's amazing the difference it's made to the job that I do, and that's reflected in the civil service support that I get as well. Thanks very much. If I, just before we wind up, if I could just go back to Mr. Burgess, um, you, you mentioned very politely earlier that you felt that the Department of Foreign Trade was just at the very beginning of the process of uh, considering what WTO rules might mean uh, for a post-Brexit UK. We took quite extensive evidence from uh, WTO experts in the committee a few uh, weeks ago, and one of the things that they had said is that the, the Nissan deal, which we don't know the details of, <coughs> if, if Nissan had been, for example, promised that its tariffs, uh, any tariff um, implications would be met uh, by the UK, that would be against WTO rules. And indeed, any WTO rules insist that free trade deals have to go across all sectors. You can't single out one particular sector and you can't pay the tariffs, certainly can't pay the tariffs of one particular sector. Do you think in your discussions with the Department of Foreign Trade there's the understanding of that kind of thing there? I don't want to do a disservice to the Department for International Trade. There are a lot of good, there are experienced people in there. It's a department that is growing rapidly. I think my comment earlier was on a very specific point about those tariff quotas in other countries, third countries schedules that at the moment the EU has a benefit from uh, you know, being able to export a certain amount of a particular commodity to the United States and how those might be uh, divided up between the rest of the EU and the UK. So I think my, my comment about the Department for International Trade being at the beginning of the process was, was very specifically on that point. They do have staff that are experienced, uh, that experience so far has been directed towards working as part of the, e the, the EU's negotiations rather than negotiating in their own right. But nevertheless, there are people there that know and understand the WTO and those mechanisms well. So what we're seeking to do, and I would say so far being quite successful, is working with Department for International Trade to understand what they're working on, uh, to see how best we can actually input to that work and to make sure that Scotland's interests are, are protected in that process. I would say the dialogue with them at official level and as the Cabinet Secretary has said uh, w between ministers as well, has been relatively good so far. I certainly hope that that continues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. We'll now have a very short suspension before we go to the next evidence session. Should Ian be able to hear us? Hello Ian, it's David at the Parliament. So are you able to hear me at the moment? David, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Ian. 
Uh, the committee is just uh, having a short suspension while uh, the witnesses change over here. Um, we can see and hear you. I'll just check with my broadcasting colleagues that they're happy. Good. Yeah, reasons happy. We're fine. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, it's now back over to the convener to restart the meeting whenever uh, the, the committee is ready. Um, uh, welcome back to the um, uh, second session of our witnesses. Um, our, our second item of business is evidence on the implications of the EU referendum for Scotland with Ian Duncan, MEP. Um, welcome, Mr Duncan. I understand that Mr Duncan has to leave at uh, 10.25 uh, in order to vote. So I'm not sure if he still wishes to make some opening remarks or if he feels there is too much pressure of time. Madam Convener, welcome. You'll be pleased to know that the President of Tunisia is overrunning and so the votes have now been postponed. So I now have, I believe, plenty of time to speak to you. So if you are amenable, I will make my opening remarks. Um, it's a pleasure to speak before this committee. You will probably be aware that I was a servant of the committee for almost a decade, uh, laterally as a clerk, and I have a very uh, strong uh, appreciation of the work done by this committee. Let me uh, cover some of the areas where I think I can offer some um, insight from Brussels. I cover fisheries, I cover energy, and I cover climate change. And each of these particular areas are of vital importance to Scotland, and each of them have a, a serious uh, part to play in the Brexit uh, deal. So let me start at the beginning by talking about climate change. I was an attender at the recent Marrakesh meeting. I've been a parliamentary delegate to each of the UN climate change conferences. And the Paris Accord is an absolutely essential element for global climate change. Brexit has the risk of impacting upon that in a negative way. Uh, let me explain why. The European Union depends upon contributions from a number of member states to help <coughs> those in the East decarbonize, uh, those who have Soviet-era technology, which primarily relies upon coal. And the Parliament's lead negotiator right now on what are called the carbon markets. And the carbon markets rely upon a series of funds to move money to Eastern Europe to help them decarbonize. We are the second biggest contributor to those potential funds and our contributions are measured in the billions. If we are not giving that money, then the reform of those uh, carbon fueled power stations will struggle. And that is not insignificant. In addition to that, when the targets were set for the European Union, it was recognized that the UK would be able to shoulder a larger part of the burden. 
If the UK steps outside that commitment, it will represent a significant increase for each of the remaining member states, which for some will be difficult to meet. So important do I believe the issue of climate change that I have recommended to my own government and to anyone else, frankly, who will listen, this should not be part of the climate, this should not be part of the Brexit negotiations. I've suggested we take it out. We are already committed to funding on a global level decarbonisation. I believe committing that money forward into Eastern Europe would be a good thing to do. Good for the United Kingdom, good for Europe, good for the globe, good for climate change. Taking it forward, when we look at electricity, and electricity again becomes very important, we don't quite have an open electricity market across Europe. We are, and again Scotland will soon become a net importer of electricity. I've been a strong advocate of a North Sea electricity grid, connecting up those markets around the North Sea Basin. Uh, integral to that is Norway and Iceland, as well as uh, ourselves. I believe, again, that that collaboration should continue. I believe, again, that our market and the markets on the continent are better and safer when we are connected. And I will be advocating strongly, again, that through Brexit, we do not lose sight of the fact that we can continue to address climate change, primarily, again, by interlinking our uh, renewables ambitions. I think that is important. Looking at fisheries, uh, again, this is an interesting area. Uh, you'll be aware of the, uh, the recent study done by the, the North Atlantic Fisheries College, uh, based up in Shetland, that noted that 65% of the EU catch, excluding ourselves, is caught in our waters. You'll also be aware that, in terms of the North Sea, certainly, uh, the EU waters constitute less than uh, 25%. And for the pelagic, the distant waters, it constitutes broadly uh, only about 15%. Uh, in this area, again, and you'll be aware of the, the, the passion with which fishermen have addressed the issue of Brexit, I believe, again, we need to find a better way of addressing the challenges of our maritime resources. And I think we're in a strong position to do that. I believe we should be able to get a better deal for our fishermen as we emerge through this. You will also be aware that today is the EU-Norway talks that will determine the quotas for the North Sea. Uh, we always think of the end of year December Council as when this is done. Of course, it actually is done now. It's done now because we share the North Sea with Norway. Um, after Brexit, the Northern North Sea will be shared between the United Kingdom and Norway, not the EU. And those negotiations will be bilateral between the UK and Norway. And it's important to stress that. The Southern North Sea will be a trilateral negotiation. And out of that will emerge uh, a different settlement. Important, again, of course, not to lose sight of the fact that we might catch the fish, but other people eat it. And I'm very happy to touch upon that within the market uh, discussion I suspect might follow. Let me talk a little bit about the mood out here. I think for the first time now there's a general acceptance that Brexit is indeed going to happen. At first, there was the bargaining element in the Kubler-Ross uh, approach to this. There was a suggestion that we could, by some other means, avoid that particular uh, outcome. I think there's now an acceptance that that will indeed go forward. And that acceptance has led to a great deal of unease uh, amongst a number of member states and their representat representatives here, not least because uh, we are the second largest net contributor in terms of finance. So when David Cameron secured a cap in the budget the last time around, that was heralded as a, a great step forward in some respects. Going forward, uh, there will be a fall in the EU budget. It will go down. The monies available for all the projects will be less. And I don't think that should be underestimated as a concern expressed, particularly at the time today, the votes I'll be taking part in very shortly are about the EU budget, again, where the European Parliament wished that budget to go up. And so I'm very conscious right now that people are now beginning to take this seriously from their own national interests as well as the collective community interests. And that will be an important element, I believe, of those negotiations going forward. Now, I'm quite happy to talk about these areas. I cover other areas as well. I, I cover LGBTI rights in the European Parliament. I cover agriculture as well. I'm very happy to, to, to comment upon these. Where I don't know, I will happily tell you I don't know the answer. Uh, it may be that I have colleagues who can help in the future and I would recommend them to you as a potential future witness. But until that point, I'm very happy to take questions. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Duncan. If I could quote from the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, uh, he, he um, back in October actually reflected um, on what he called the cake philosophy, that one can have the EU cake and eat it too. Um, and he said, to all who believe in it, I propose a simple experiment, buy a cake, eat it and see if it's still there on the plate. Um, now, the cake philosophy was back in the news uh, um, again this week when it, notes um, that were caught by the press suggested that um, 
the have your cake and eat it uh, approach was the favoured approach by the UK government. Um, I wondered if you think that that is likely um, to, uh, the UK government is likely to be able to have its cake and eat it or what the cost of Brexit is li likely to be? Thank you, Madam Convener. Uh, another interesting uh, way of looking at that is um, have your EU president and eat it, because unfortunately Donald Tusk's certainty in his role, as you will be aware, is now in doubt. Um, that would be a, a significant impact on the negotiations, I believe, going forward, because again, he's no longer supported by his own uh, member state. I would argue going into a negotiation, the best possible way to go in is with the have your cake and eat it approach. The very suggestion you go in with anything less than the, the biggest thing you want to have would seem to me a very, very weak way to begin a negotiation. And that is why, again, right now on the other side, that's exactly what the EU is doing as well as it begins to examine these elements. So, for example, much in the news, and rightly so, is the question of um, residency of EU citizens' rights within the United Kingdom. And, again, a very strong move to have that recognised and taken out of the negotiations. I think that's a good thing to have done. But of course, you'll be aware that just as a matter of a few days ago, uh, Chancellor Merkel said, no, that's not, that's now part of the negotiation. So again, this idea that we face where we can look at this as anything other than a hard negotiation from both sides at the beginning, I don't think we should be in any doubt that both sides will have to negotiate with the hardest possible position at the beginning. But if we have to find a compromise which is good for the EU and good for the United Kingdom, then we will need to find that common sweet ground in the middle. And that is what we're looking for, the sweetest cake possible. And will you be encouraging your colleagues to compromise on the issue of, of free movement, which seems to be at the, the, the crux of matters? Again, the issue of free movement is worth exploring in some greater depth. You will be aware that when the eastern states joined the EU not so many years ago, the right to free movement was absolutely circumscribed. Only the UK and Ireland allowed free movement at that particular point. This inherent right that we take for granted was not offered to those who came from Poland or the Czech Republic or Slovakia. That freedom of movement that we now claim is inviolable was frankly set aside. So I would argue right now that we need to find an appropriate way to address the issue of the freedom of movement of workers. That's what the treaties say and I believe we should find that. After all, we have a significant migrant population in Scotland and in the United Kingdom and we depend upon that and our economy depends upon that. And people do want to come here for that very reason. And so again, when we're looking at the, the settlement that comes through here, I would hope we can find a sensible approach, not just to the citizenship issue, but also to the movement of people issue. And I believe we can find that because both the EU and the UK would be the weaker if we cannot find common ground on that point. Okay, thank you. I'll pass to my colleague, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. And I, I, the convener mentioned one uh, uh, apparent set of objectives that was made public last week, but there were others that were made public very officially, and the Office of Budget Responsibility has predicted that the, the increase, the uh, requirement for public borrowing will increase by some £58.7 billion over five years as a result of Brexit. Does that figure sound reasonable to you? I'm afraid, Mr MacDonald, I'm not an economist. I would have read the same figures you did, so I can offer no further insight into that. The Institute of Fiscal Studies published figures uh, also last week which said that our real wage uh, levels are likely to continue to be low and we will have the longest period of pressure downwards on real wages for 70 years. Do you recognise and are you prepared to comment on those numbers? Yes, I can happily comment on those. We're going to go through a period of economic turmoil. Macro constitutional change brings that. I'm under no illusion about that. I was very clear that that would be the consequence of uh, independence for Scotland. I'm very clear that that will be the consequence we will live through right now. The challenge going forward is how then do we emerge from the other side? And what do we do to try and ensure that we protect as best we can every single element of our economy as strongly as we can? And so in that regard, these figures are important, but it's also important to look at forecast figures to see what we can be looking at, what we should aspire to be, rather than looking at worst case scenarios. We should prepare for the worst case scenarios. We should build for the best case scenarios. So you don't, uh, given that you don't dispute the OBR's uh, pred pr prediction of a very substantial hit on the UK economy over the next five years, and that you accept the IFS's projection of a very substantial hit on the wages of working people over the next five years, uh, what, what is it that you see as the silver lining to these very enormous clouds that uh, you, you acknowledge are hanging over us? 
Well, again, to be clear, those enormous clouds are as nothing compared to clouds hanging over the Eurozone, as we'll find during the upcoming referendum taking place in Italy today, if that, not today, later on this uh, month, if indeed we find that vote goes against Prime Minister Renzi, then we will find a run on those banks. We will find the Eurozone itself beginning to go through a cathartic, critical moment. What I would note just now in looking at these figures is we need to see the challenge for both sides of the channel in this regard, because there are going to be challenges ahead. We should be under no illusion about that. What we do need to try and work at is what is the growth strategy we are trying to build. Bearing in mind again, when you look at the sclerotic growth that you're witnessing in the Eurozone, compared even now still to the growth within the United Kingdom, the economy within the United Kingdom is more robust than it might have been thought and has managed to weather these early tremors. There are bigger tremors to come. I'm under no illusion about that. But again, I note as I cast my eye to the European continent that they too have extreme problems going forward. And the real issue that we do face now is we're in far more uncertain times, not least because of Brexit, but also because many of the shibboleths which the EU have relied upon have been moved. Our membership of the EU has been vital both in terms of liberalising the wider economy and the markets there. We have been a principal driver for free trade agreements at a global level. If you take our advocacy out of that, it becomes different. And then throw into that equation the slightly quixotic and whimsical element of the arrival of Mr Trump. And then the world does become very, very uncertain going forward. I, I, I accept all of that. And, and, and the, the point you're making about the impact of Brexit in the European Union is one that has been made by a number of witnesses to this committee um, from other European Union member states and indeed from, from other European countries. The question then, uh, I think, has to be uh, how the United Kingdom can go forward in its relations with those European Union member states if the European Union is in the degree of difficulty you've described. And from a Brussels perspective, what do you believe um, is possible? You ta you've talked, I think, this morning of wouldn't it be good to exclude climate change? Wouldn't it be good to exclude um, the rights of residents of EU nationals living in the United Kingdom? Wouldn't it be good to maintain the North Sea electricity grid? I think uh, I would agree with all those three, wouldn't it be good? But how possible is it to do any of those things in a circumstance where, where the UK is not clear about its negotiating position and the EU is in uh, increasing difficulty of its, in, in its own right? The one thing I would note is, um, the morning after the Brexit vote, the British government fell. I think it's important to stress that a new government came in whose policy was fundamentally different from its predecessor. It was now a government that had to take forward the Brexit uh, approach. David Cameron was not an advocate of that. It has taken time for a government which had a fundamentally different policy to vault fast. In some respects, taking that time has been helpful for both sides, because I don't believe, truthfully, that the EU was in any better preparedness for this unexpected convulsion than we in the United Kingdom were. And so right now, they too are developing what I believe are very challenging uh, talks intra-27, and that in itself will be the measure of what comes out, because there are elements of this where we would hope that common sense would play a part. I thought the residency question would be one of them, where common sense would play a part, and I thought that with the movement on the British side, I thought there would be a compensatory movement on the European side, but that common sense is not applied there, and that disappoints me. When I look at something like climate change, again, I would say common sense surely must apply here. We must be able to see a way through recognizing the, the greater threat that, that this represents to us. But I'm not, sadly, as optimistic as I would like to be on these areas. There are clearly areas where we can collaborate and collaborate very strongly, whether it be on Erasmus, whether it be on Marie Curie, whether we look again at the Horizon 2020 approach. There are many areas in which we can continue to work very closely, uh, intimately indeed, with the European Union. But I hope common sense is the watchword from both sides, because both sides will be damaged by a failure to find the common sensible approach to resolving these issues. I suppose the other point that's worth stressing is, it's only really in the last few weeks here that that recognition of inevitability of departure has become accepted. Up until that point, there was a view that perhaps by other means, whether it be the need for another election in the United Kingdom or uh, an issue which might somehow or other change the government's policy might still allow this to continue on. There is now a broad uh, finality, a recognition that this is not now likely to be the case. And so I think there is a, a sorrow in that, and I'm witnessing that amongst many colleagues. Um, I work very closely with colleagues from across the political spectrum and across the national divide. We work very closely. We make, we make good progress together. 
and they know that they will miss us. I certainly will miss. I will certainly miss doing that too. Okay. Uh, Ross Greer, please. Mr Duncan, you mentioned the North Sea offshore grid in your opening remarks. That's something that has been pioneered, pushed by the European Commission. It's a collaboration of EU member states and Norway, which has significant links with the EU. Even similar, smaller projects like the Isles project for Scotland, the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland, uh, the feasibility funding for that came through European Union funds. I'd be interested in your further thoughts on what the future of these energy collaboration projects might be, particularly if we're heading towards a hard Brexit scenario, because the implications there are not just for ourselves, but particularly for the Republic of Ireland as well, due to the geographical realities of integrating them into a European grid that the UK might not then be part of. Thank you, Mr. Career. I'm always very conscious of not using the word hard or soft Brexit in this context. I think the North Sea grid's a no-brainer. Frankly, I thought it was an easy thing for people to see. When we were looking again at the challenges facing the European Union, both in terms of climate change and energy security, the North Sea represented a stable investment prospect. You'll be pleased to know that I wrote a paper with one of your colleagues out here, Bas Eichert. We sat and we wrote a paper together. The first time a Green and a Conservative had written a paper jointly in the European Parliament. There was much surprise at that. But we were on the same page. For different reasons, I suspect, we were on the same page. Which was, this is a good thing. The funding which has come so far has been good, but that is still, if you like, the early stage funding. In order to move this forward, it's serious money. Now, I had thought there's something here called the FC fund, the Juncker fund, which is a vast, big pot of money. And I've been lobbying furiously to get cash from that to try and get this moving forward. I haven't been successful because, in truth, a lot of the endeavours in energy and climate change have been more about the energy security than they have been about the Paris Accord, and they've tilted the money more to the east. So a lot of it's been around pipeline questions, a lot of it's been around uh, security questions on the the eastern neighbourhood margin. So going forward, I still think the North Sea grid is an absolutely pitch-perfect necessary element to our collaboration in terms of electricity and on climate change. The body that exists trying to take this forward is not an EU institution, so it need not be impacted by the Brexit issue. And as you point out, Norway and its renewables and its um, the power stations which allow you to broadly uh, store the, uh, the electricity are vital. And I think Scotland would be vital as well. If only our power stations were on the other side of the country, uh, that would be a lot easier. But we can't change the mountains, uh, sadly. But I think, again, going forward, this is an area where we need to be clever about it because it's absolutely vital for our energy needs, our electricity needs, our climate change ambitions, and for the rest of Europe. So what suggestions, then, would you give to the Scottish government to ensure that the UK government doesn't jeopardise this and that a UK outside of the EU is still part of these projects? I don't think the UK government will. I mean, the meetings I'm having with them are to recognise why this is important. There will be an interregnum as people become focused upon things which are not about energy and not about climate change. They'll be focused upon other elements. So I'm not under any illusion that this will be more of a challenge. But the UK government now is committed to the North Sea grid. That's helpful. The Scottish government is too. I'm ambitious to bring some of my European colleagues up to Scotland uh, I'm intending to write the next draft or the next version of this particular joint paper with Mr. Eichardt so that the, both of us again can present this as how on earth do we do it now that Brexit is here so that we see that route going forward. I think we have opportunities to collaborate because people still want the same outcome. They're just no longer quite as clear about how the move on the board gets us to it. And to some degree, as much in your hands as mine, is the pressure we must place upon all those who are involved to get the right outcome. And that, I hope, will be something we will be able to collaborate on together. Thank you. And Jackson Carlow. Uh, good morning, Mr Duncan. Um, you've touched on a couple of specific areas. I, I quite like your impression of atmosphere. It, it's some time now since the committee was in Brussels. We were there in July. And the committee's also heard evidence from uh, other of your colleagues. Uh, undoubtedly, when we were there, there was still very much uh, astonishment um, and consternation, I think, in the political establishment on both sides of the channel at the outcome of the referendum, and a great deal of recognition and sympathy within the European Union that Scotland, together with other areas of the United Kingdom, but Scotland certainly um, had uh, delivered a different result to other parts of the United Kingdom in the referendum. The question then was what capital could be attached to those regrets 
Um, since then, of course, everybody's been away in their own summer recess over there. You've come back. There are other problems. There are other elections facing member states. Uh, you've hinted at a kind of uh, a sort of coming to terms with the inevitability of um, Britain leaving amongst colleagues in the European Union now. What practical recognition do you think remains in relation to the vote that Scotland took, along with other parts of the United Kingdom, and how that might uh, figure as we go forward in any negotiated settlement? Uh, Mr. Carroll, that, that, yes, that's, that's very much a, the, the question on many people's minds. I, I would note a couple of, of things here. There was a lot of regret, particularly, particularly about Scots, because for some reason Scots are just liked more than some other uh, individuals. Make of that what you will. So there was a regret, but the reality is you can't bank regret. That's the bottom line. And so much as there was sympathy amongst a number of member states and representatives of member states, when it comes to the negotiations, it's not going to be done on a sympathetic basis. It will be done fighting for national self-interest. That's why, again, I, I'm very keen to see uh, each of the home nations within the United Kingdom linking arms to get the strongest possible deal, because it's in the interests of the other side to try and encourage division to encourage uh, some sort of gap between potentially Cardiff and London or Edinburgh and London or, or whatever. What we need to know going forward is there is an absolutely rock solid, ironclad British position for the best deal that everybody has signed up to. So for example, last week, um, indeed I was in Strasbourg last week, but uh, the, the Scottish minister, uh, Mr. Russell was across. Some of his comments were very unhelpful, uh, truthfully because they encouraged Spain to intervene at a stage when it simply would not have done so. Spain is one of these nations which you can always see on the edges, ready to get involved. It doesn't often do so. Last week, it did. It got straight in there and was very clear that there will be no Scottish exceptionalism. And I think that is, again, the sort of division which can be exploited by these negotiators. We need to have a Team UK approach to get the best deal. That is what we must have. And I believe we can get that deal, because I do believe working in strong collaboration, Edinburgh to London, London to Cardiff, Cardiff to uh, Belfast, and so on, I think we can do that. But there is now a recognition that each of those nations is fighting for their interests as well. And when we talk about the negotiations, it will be how do, we, how do we reconcile? Because it's not actually one against 27. So when it comes to fisheries, for example, we're primarily having to deal with those who are bordering the North Sea. So that's not 27, that's a subset. When we're looking at some of the issues we have around our uh, greater trade interests, it's not 27, because not each of the 27 states trades equally with us. When it's freedom of movement questions, again, it's not one versus 27. The Eastern European states have a greater interest in freedom of movement than might be the case of um, Italy or, or Spain. So what we're having to see now is we need to be united. That's the first statement and a given. But we also have to recognise that it's no longer in the interests of the EU to be our friends, and sympathetic though they may well be, that will cut no mustard out here. The Prime Minister indicated that she had sought to take the issue of uh, freedom of uh, residency status uh, for EU nationals and uh, UK and Scottish nationals within the European Union. Uh, but that initiative was uh, publicly rebuffed by Chancellor Merkel and one or two others. Is that a widely held view across the European Parliament member states? Are, are there others who indicated that they would have preferred that an arrangement could have been made uh, exceptionally at the start of this process? Or, or do they too see that very much as uh, something they're not willing to do because they choose to make that part of the negotiation? i be very frank, there was shock in the Parliament when that announcement became clear, because everyone, but everyone here had assumed the stumbling block was Theresa May and her inability to, to negotiate and her unwillingness to recognise this shouldn't be part of the negotiations. And a lot of people have been talking about that, and again, a lot of currency. When uh, Chancellor Merkel's very clear and trenchant view came out, there was stunned silence. Truthfully, it stunned silence amongst people who believed it was Britain being exceptional in this regard and, and being too mean-spirited to, to, to our European uh, colleagues. There's now a recognition that this really is going to be hardball because even on the issues where we can see the common sense of a mutual approach, if you like, taking it out of the, 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 the debating and negotiating chamber, there's now a recognition that it is hardball and it will be hardball from the 27th. Even on the issues where we don't believe we have a disagreement, we do recognise that 
the Brits in Spain or the Eastern Europeans in Scotland, whatever it happens to be, are an integral part of our community, our economy, our country. That's a no-brainer to take that out of the equation, and yet it's still, once again, four square back in there. It's a negotiating tool brought back to the table by the Germans. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just come back as a supplementary to Jackson Carlos' um, previous question? Uh, when we were in uh, Brussels, one of the um, member states that we spoke to uh, made the point that if Scotland presented a proposal, a differentiated Scottish proposal, if it was endorsed by the UK government, then people would be far more likely to listen uh, to a proposal that was endorsed by the UK government. And of course, Mrs May, when she came to uh, Edinburgh in July, indicated that she, w she was listening to Scotland and Scotland's understood Scotland's concerns. Um, and I believe that was a point that Mr Carlo has made in the, the chamber as well. If, if a Scottish position was endorsed by the UK government, other member states would view it differently. So we, would you agree with that? And would you be encouraging your colleagues in the UK government to take that approach? May I ask a question? Um, which uh, EU government were you meeting with? Well, our, our, as uh, Mr. Carlo knows as well, our discussions were with a number of uh, a number of governments, and they were off the record. So it wouldn't be appropriate to say who, as Mr. Mr. Carlo hasn't said who it was either. Well, um, I would be surprised. It would depend upon which government representatives spoke to you. Um, that would be quite an explosive. Uh, position for a member state to have taken. Um, we saw, for example, last week when this issue about talks being undertaken between the Scottish government and the Spanish government, how quickly the foreign minister of Spain stepped in to say there were no talks whatever. So I would be really surprised if a member state now were advocating Scottish exceptionalism, because I don't believe, and I genuinely would be very surprised if that was the opinion strongly held by the government in anything other than what might be very private discussions you would have very, very far off the record. Yeah, well, what, what I was talking about, and I think what Mr Carlo has, we may, may want to come in on this, but uh, what Mr Carlo, I think, was talking about previously in the chamber was a position that was endorsed by the UK government. Um, and I couldn't see what the problem would be there if the UK government endorsed a particular Scottish position. Well, um, the yes, problem would yeah, be that... I mean, I just, I mean, my recollection is that um, when we met with some of the ambassadors to the European Union, there was a suggestion that there were variables, uh, I think, uh, whether these were around Erasmus or Horizon 2020, where there were specific Scottish interests that might be reflected, but that in order for any European government to be able to have a meaningful conversation around those variables with Scotland, I think very much the Team UK approach had to be established in order that there was a harmony in those discussions, because they felt that if there was a sense of an antagonism between the member nations within the United Kingdom, uh, the expression they used was that the shutters would come down in any such discussions. I, I'm not sure my recollection was that it was of a more fundamental variance, but more that there were obvious within the arrangements that had to be obtained areas where Scotland would have an opportunity uh, to have a slightly different arrangement arrived at. Mr. Carlo, Carlo, thank you for your clarification. And uh, Madam Convener, I owe you an apology. I misunderstood your point. I would anticipate there being elements where there could be a differential relationship between uh, Scotland and the, uh, and the EU. If, for example, there were uh, an appetite in England and Scotland to continue with Erasmus, but not for Wales to do so, or whatever it happened to be, yes, I could perceive that there would be opportunities within the framework established by the UK government and the negotiations. But if there were to be uh, a recognition of a, an entirely separate packaged deal, even that alone would raise anxieties, certainly with the Spanish who have been very vocal thus far on that matter. Uh, I suspect the same would probably be true in Belgium because of their, uh, their uh, issues around separation. There are other places within the EU where that notion would be troubling, I think. So yes, there are certainly possibilities for um, Scotland or any member of the home uh, nations to determine a different 
suite of elements within the UK negotiated package. I think that probably is true. But it would depend on what level you're doing it and what fundamental level you, and how far you drill down. Thank you. I don't think we did get down to drilling down to mentioning Erasmus or um, Horizon 2020, but um, uh, I think we'll do, just leave it at that. I don't know if we have any more. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, Mr Duncan. Uh, just in terms of the, the two-year uh, negotiation uh, period, do you think that uh, will uh, be reached, bearing in mind the, the, the next round of EU elections take place in 2019? Yes, yes, I think it will. Um, I don't think you're going to get the fully fledged and wrapped up package by that particular point. I think there will be uh, transition elements to it. I think one of the first uh, elements of that transition will be the end of, of the role of uh, MEPs, uh, the end of the role of our involvement in the College of Commissioners. I think those elements will, will, will end probably in the spring of 2019. I would anticipate that. Uh, the, the exiting, oddly enough, probably isn't that challenging a concept insofar as cancelling your membership is straightforward. The, the test is what then replaces it, and that's why it needs to be looking at potentially transition arrangements in particular areas, whether it be in the wider question of food and drink, which Mr Lockhead raised earlier, whether it be in the areas around the, the market question, which I suspect is the beating heart of this, whether it is in the cultural and social elements. There are different transition periods you can anticipate before our uh, our relationship with the EU ends. So I, I, I think the idea that we will literally be entirely out and concluded and everything detailed and done by that date, no, I don't think that is the case. But I don't think that necessarily need be the case either. I think the transition element will be important as we begin to see the evolution of our relationship with the EU. Um, thank you for that. And certainly in terms of the uh, well, the transitional element. Um, how do you see the, the therefore the, the discussion uh, taking place with the uh, with the electorate um, across uh, the UK? Uh, because I don't, the issue of transitional uh, arrangements uh, weren't really something that were raised uh, too much, certainly from my recollection, without the EU referendum. No, you're right, uh, Mr. Merkel. I would always argue that a, a referendum is the wrong way to make fundamental constitutional change because you reduce very complex issues down to a yes-no question. And I think in that process, as we've witnessed in our two referendums, that can lead to confusion, that can lead to frustration, that can lead to uh, animosity. I think it will be absolutely essential to see as the, the deal itself evolves that the United Kingdom Parliament and the parliaments of the devolved uh, home nations themselves are actively involved both in the deliberation and discussion on that. I think that will be necessary. We are going to go through this fundamental change in our constitutional arrangement. I think that is right and that is proper. And there will be, I would imagine, uh, an election that will approach at some point upon which there may well be this question held dear by certain uh, manifestos of certain political parties who will, who will then seek a mandate through that. I don't anticipate that any time soon. I think we'll be sticking to the fixed timetable. But I think it's absolutely essential that people understand the length and the breadth of the nation, what exactly is happening. The one thing I would note, and um, there are six of us out here, and I think we remain the anonymous elected members from Scotland, insofar as we're not widely known back at home. Um, and that's not for want of effort. And I know if I speak to uh, your colleagues, Mr. Smith and Mr. Hudson, they too are very staunch in their attempts to try and communicate it isn't always that easy. There isn't always a great appetite to hear from your local MEP. So trying to help people understand how the EU works itself has always been something of a challenge. Trying to help people understand how it will work without the, the, the EU is equally challenging. And we will have a role for that, I hope. I mean, I know that my five, I know that my four colleagues will be working very hard on trying to take that particular matter forward. That will be an issue, however, because it's a dialogue and it does require the people to want to be part of that dialogue. And I know thus far in terms of our understanding and engagement with the EU, it hasn't always been based upon the soundest of understanding about how it works and what it means. Uh, and, uh, and finally, <clears throat> uh, bearing in mind the issue of the transitional arrangements, um, what, uh, what do you consider uh, will actually be the impact uh, of leaving the EU uh, on businesses and also on inward investment uh, for Scotland? Well, I would argue that any uh, constitutional adjustment impacts on confidence, which it does. It, it impacts upon investment. I think that is true. I think it's a sad but true statement. It was true, I believe, during the independence referendum. It's true now. 
the challenge for us now is to try and embrace the opportunities it gives us. So I know there's been some discussion about um, free trade agreements, bilateral or multilateral. Seven years for a, a multilateral agreement with Canada was way, way too long. Several years were spent on dealing with the human rights elements. For example, two years were spent on that. Not that human rights aren't important, but again, as we start to look at Canada and its human rights record, it isn't necessarily that bad and should not, I think, have delayed the agreement by two years. There are opportunities, I believe, when we look at um, bilateral agreements. That is evident. And the EU hasn't been very good at brokering multilateral agreements. So when earlier on there was discussion about the EU has the expertise, yes and no. It does have the expertise, but much of that expertise recently has been consumed by only two agreements, CETA, which should pass through, and TTIP, which is dead. And those are the agreements that they've focused almost exclusively upon, to the exclusion of areas where Scotland would principally benefit. So if we'd had the EU working hard in Southeast Asia or in India, where again, the, to Mr Lockhead's credit, the spirits drinks industry would see an extraordinary benefit if the EU had brokered deals there, but it didn't. And the other problems I've written, I commissioned two reports on, on the notion of enforcement of a free trade deal. A free trade deal is only good if you can enforce the rules and so forth. The EU is dreadful at enforcing its free trade deals. We commissioned a, a learned academic uh, from Zurich who came across, we looked at what the target should be for enforcement of EU trade deals. Now you would think that the, the target should be 100% enforcement. The target the EU set itself is 20%. It's currently meeting 10% of its enforcement requirements. So the free trade agreements brokered by the EU at the moment are not actually worth the paper they're written on. And you need a serious enforcement uh, division within the, the EU to address this. And I've, I've raised this, I've raised it with the Commission, saying you need to enforce the free trade agreements. And they keep coming back saying, but it's not one of our priorities. It's, the priority is brokering the deal, the enforcement isn't the point. I can't think what the point of that is. So I digress gently, but I come back again to a very simple point, which is there are opportunities now for a bilateral agreement to be moved forward more quickly. And I would say that, because trying to move it forward at the pace of the slowest camel in the train of 28 has proven to be, as we palpably see with CETA, and even allowing for the Wallonian intervention at the very end, has been a bedraggling process to try and get us here. And TTIP, which was meant to be the single biggest trade agreement on the face of the planet, is dead now. Supplementary from Ross Greer. It's on a slightly different point, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Duncan, it's been really useful to get your reading of the mood music on, in Brussels in regards to the, the UK home nations. I was just wondering specifically what the level of understanding is of the absolute necessity of ensuring there's no hard border between the Republic of Ireland and the North. That has implications for some of the potential uh, solutions that have been mooted for Scotland, but it is in itself essential as part of an international treaty between the state that we're part of and another state? It's probably not well understood here. Uh, that's an issue that f clearly, rightly, uh, is uh, of great concern to the UK and to Ireland, but it probably isn't fully appreciated anywhere else, if I'm being honest. Um, it needs to be. So I would argue that's important, but certainly within the Parliament, their focus has not been upon uh, on that border question. And I, I think even discussing it, most people who are not already familiar with it don't get it. Um, thank you very much. We think we'll um, wind up now, and I'd like to thank Mr Duncan for coming to give evidence to us. Thank you, and we will now suspend. Thank you.